three. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest. He's got a unique spin on a old sort of strategy. So very excited. But before we talk to our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. And I'm going to throw another one in there just for fun for some learning like Zapier, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Learn more about Flight School. Just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training. In 16 weeks, we'll get you up and running with the Land Geek Sherpa himself, Scott Todd. So today's guest is Al Williamson from leadinglandlord.com. And if you don't know about Al, he's a formal, uh, former civil engineer and the author of The Building Wealth with Inner City Rentals. Um, it took him about seven years, but he's figured out how to create enough side income, uh, income and over and beyond his market rate rents to cover the monthly mortgage of his apartment building. And he's packaged all his ideas and put those into a book called 40 Ways to Increase the Net Income of Your Rental Property. He's got a lot going on. And um, I'm really excited to talk to Al Williamson. Al, welcome. Hey, Mark and Scott. How are you guys doing? Good. It's a pleasure to be here. We're great. So, um, Al, let's just rewind the tape and tell us how you got from becoming a, a civil engineer to quitting your job and becoming a the the, the landlord guy, if you will. <laughs> the landlord scientist. Well, it was um, after I started in 96 with a three unit building that I, I squeezed my new bride into and we were house hacking. So we, we did that and, and that thing quadrupled on us and which led us to a, um, an apartment building, eight unit building. But during the time, even though I was a civil engineer and I was doing good with my numbers, I was tracking, I was noticing that my maintenance cost was wiping me out. It was taking a year's worth of profit to put on a new roof or the paint, you know, there goes my profits. And so I started figuring out, hey, there's gotta be a, another way there's got to be a, well, why can't we um, find some other ways to make money? And, and that started my quest because I figured I wasn't alone when I got other landlords by themselves. And I said, hey, this is happening to you. They would say, yeah, it looks good on paper. But um, when I look at my net after, after all of my maintenance and everything, before, you know, of course, with, before depreciation and all that, um, it wasn't looking so good. All right. Wow. So how did you solve the problem? Well, as I decided I was going to start collecting ideas on, on side income. You know, I wanted to diversify my income, just like any business. It sounds revolutionary for, for rental business, but you don't want just one source of income. You know, so let's see if we can pack this thing. And I set the challenge. I wanted to pay for the mortgage entirely with income that wasn't rent. That was my quest. So I started uh, just collecting ideas and testing them and um, kind of like a, a, um, a librarian would, just trying to file them away in different categories and, and seeing if I could do it. And um, in 2015, I was able to do it with, um, with my apartment complex, paying the mortgage with um, income that didn't include rents. Nice, nice. Scott Todd. So what did it include? Like, how, how did you do it? Like, what if, if the so it's mortgage was... So, 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 so clever, some different things, um, different ideas. I, some I tested, some I just got from, squeezed out of different people, such as, um, you know, there's that payday rent, collecting rent every two weeks. You end up with a extra, you know, if you collect it every two weeks, then you end up with an extra month's worth of income at the end of the year. If, if, you, if you do the math, you see that you end up with a, because there's an extra um, week per every two months, right? 
<laughs> you guys are following me. You have to no, do no. That. I'm with you. I'm with you. So like, okay. I'm tracking what you're saying. So That's like, thing. We, so es- essentially if you, you offered, you offered somebody the ability to pay their rent every two weeks when they got paid, as opposed to once a month, that gave you a 13th month. That's right. Rent. That's right. Okay. That's one of like, the other ideas. Like, we get to get that like at a big scale, like you had to have a lot of different things, right? Well, I, I see. I did a composite of things. So that's one thing I did. Another thing I did was, um, was uh, I, I provided Wi for this is for my eight unit building, provided Wi Fi for all the units. They were paying their own. Um, everyone's paying their own internet. So I, I covered everyone's internet and gave them a 50% discount. And I took uh, savings, created income for myself that way. That's the second thing I was doing. I had a, a bike sharing program earlier on in 2015. It's really common now here in Sacramento, California now, lots of bike sharing, but I was doing it in there. I was charging um, um, $40 a month for that. And I started housing international students and doing furnished rentals. So, and, um, and, and making it a, a flexible terms on my leases. So I was able to increase my income as well with furnished housing. So all those, all those things together, and I think I'm missing some others, but I, um, I itemized it a few times on, on bigger pockets when it happened, when I, when I passed the finish line, but, um, all that, and, and writing that book, 40 Ways to Increase the Net Income in Your Rental Property, led me to conclude that, that it was uh, furnished rentals that was really the, set the stage for all these other income streams. So, so that's why I started focusing solely on furnished rentals. This gives you a lot of um, safety nets, and it opens up a lot more um, opportunities for ancillary income. So can you expand on that? So how, how does it work with a furnished rental as, to, as opposed to an unfurnished rental? Oh, absolutely. So I see with like for one of this Sacramento apartment building or any dwelling, you can um, operate it. You can leave it vacant. That's one way. <laughs> you can do traditional landlording. Everyone knows that. You can do furnished rentals long-term, long-term furnished rentals and earn about 30% above market with, uh, by having furnishings. Okay, then you can do, I call it flexible term rentals, which is kind of like Airbnb falls into that where you flex your terms and you flex how many pets you have and things like that. And then you can do a, a dormitory type of model, I call it kind of renting rooms. And, and then the highest use of your place is corporate housing. So with the same dwelling, you can do all those different types of operations inside of it and generate up to 10 times more on a net income basis with the exact same property by uh, varying how you operate. So that's, that's the, but as soon as you go furnish rentals, let's talk about the downside, okay? So if you can't do corporate housing, if that fails on you, then you can drop back down to do Airbnb, okay? And everyone knows how to do that. And if that doesn't work for you, you can drop back down to doing uh, long-term furnished rentals. Everyone knows that. So that's kind of, there's lots of transitional housing, things like that you can do. And if that doesn't work, then you can always fall back to traditional landlording, which I think is the riskiest place to be because if you fail there, you don't have any more to fall back to. You fall back to um, being vacant. So I think the safest thing you can do is furnish your rentals and, and um, enjoy making three times more net income than, than a traditional landlord. Very interesting. Very interesting. So is this location dependent for corporate housing? Is it, I mean, what's, what's sort of the sweet spot when you're going to look for a, a rental like that? I mean, are you going to look for um, like you have like an eight plex? Are you going to look for a four plex? Are you going to look for a single family home? What, what type of dwelling and what type of location is ideal? That's a great question. Now, I think every dwelling, I call it dwelling because that opens up um, boats and everything, anything that you can sleep in has the highest, best use, okay? So uh, there's, there's things you can do with whatever rental you have right now, 
And then you can always acquire something that's right in the sweet spot or in the happening place of your downtown. So if, if you, um, one of the rules I say is there's an extended stay hotel. I'm talking about extended stay America, residence Inn, those types of things that have a kitchenette in, in them. Then that means without a question, the research has already been done because it costs about $22 million to, to create one of these things. The research has already been done by people that know way more than, than you or I could ever <laughs> learn. So that, that means that you can do corporate housing uh, and that if there is one, if you see it in your town, that means stays on 18 days on average um, is viable, no question about it. And that mean, which means that you know stays over 30 days is, is part of that mix. So that means you can start competing for those people who are coming for 30 days and longer because uh, Scott, you ever stay at a hotel for a long period of time for like two weeks and longer? Um, well, not, not in one trip, but I, I uh, have I relocated, though, right? have relocated for work and I would, I would uh, stay at the same hotel for like six weeks, but okay. it was like Monday through Thursday or Sunday okay. through Thursday. So did, I did you get stayed. a little bit of um, stir crazy in there? Uh, yeah, that's fair to say. That's fair to say. <laughs> so, that's what we find. That's why a furnished rental just can compete against a, a, a corporate extended stay, no question about it, because you can get a, a lot more. People enjoy a lot more, a full-size refrigerator, full oven, and, and they can do it for a lot less. So there's just no competition at all. Scott? So one of the questions I have is like, you know, I was looking over the, uh, the book that you referenced, the 40 ways to increase the net income. And one, one of the things you talk about in there is like, you know, p power plants or utilities, if you will. Right. Right. And, you know, in there, you, you know, like you talk about like solar or whatever, like can, can, can I, because I've been told you can't like, I've been told that, um, and obviously every state's going to be a little bit different, right? But essentially what I've been told is that you cannot profit from utilities at all. So kind of like the example that, that you gave on the, the, um, the internet, for example, like I, I know a guy that, that owns uh, some multifamily, the, the properties were not submetered or the units were not submetered. And so essentially he had one unit going in. And then what he did was he determined like how much that they were using and actually what it was, it was from a well is what it was. I apologize. It was from a well and they weren't submetered. They would just go in there. So what he was doing is he's looking at the, the cost of the well and adding, added in some labor, et cetera, charged the residents for the, for the, like the well water, the maintenance, the, you know, the, the stuff that gets in there. Next thing you know, he slapped with a big old fine because he was profiting <laughs> from utilities. Like did, have you found that at all? Have you looked at that? Well, there's some ways around that. Absolutely. So um, one thing is with this, this talk, go back to your, your solar plant or your, your power plant. Um, they do want you just to have enough to power whatever dwelling that's underneath there. Like they don't want you to, um, it doesn't make sense in their minds to have a, a really big system if you have a small house. But nowadays, as things are always morphing, the industry is always evolving. You can also offset your, like you can put a uh, solar onto your rental and it can offset the power, the bill on your personal residence. So they can, they're moving things around now. They're allowing you to, you can also purchase into a, um, a plant in the desert and use that to offset your power. So they are um, decentralizing it and moving it out, accounting for it on your bill and allowing and turning it into a credit and um, allowing you to use it however you choose. So that's how that's, how that's happening. There's, there's things coming out all along as uh, solar drops in price is, is um, evolving. Then the, the next thing about, let's talk about Wi-Fi. If you walk into your local Starbucks, um, they give you complimentary Wi-Fi in exchange for you buying, participating in their service. I call that the coffee shop model but they're not charging you directly for the Wi-Fi. They're charging you for the coffee. So that's essentially it. I'm, I'm not charging people for 
quote unquote Wi-Fi, they get a complimentary in exchange for other services such as a, a newsletter. Same thing. Same thing you go to Home Depot, they give you complimentary Wi-Fi and it's all spread out through through their um, the markup and their prices. So it's the same thing. You're just offsetting however you bill it so that you fit into the, the right category, just like everyone does um, all over the United States. Every business does it. It's okay. the same package. All right. So Al, knowing what you know now about landlording, what's some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your area of expertise? Oh, the worst advice would be to... Um, Mm, so, so, some of the oh boy, I never even I never wrapped my mind around thinking about that. That's that's a that's a good question. I I definitely would. Yeah, I definitely the the people that lean towards overpaying for a a rental with the idea that they're going to do Airbnb to to make it work, I think is the absolute silliest thing ever. It takes away your safety nets that I was kind of talking to you about how you can um, drop down. You're not going to be able to do that. You're just going to be upside down. So I don't like that. Um, I, I'm not in favor of uh, the adversarial approach to landlording that you often, you know, traditional landlording is where, uh, you know, you got to enforce your rules, which you absolutely have to. But, but I think there's more joint venture opportunities to, to to create some, some profit centers that, that the, the tenant can enjoy as well. And that puts you into, that kind of spins your flywheel in, in the uh, money-making direction. And once you start doing that, you're like, for example, if you did a, a joint venture for parking, if, you, if your rental was located in an area that was the high demand for parking and allowed, um, the t you know, the, allowed the tenant to open up a parking spot, they make room, and they shared in some of this, the, the benefits of sharing their parking space, you just simply mod monetize that. Um, so, so that's kind of one opportunity. Same with car sharing. There's opportunities to park an extra car and, and generate revenue for there if the tenant's cooperative on that. Same thing with um, outdoor advertising. You can turn your, your rental into a, a billboard, so to speak. And if your tenant's... Um, can enjoy some of the savings. They're more, more uh, apt to allow, allow that to happen. So on and so forth. As soon as you flip over to, hey, let's create some joint ventures and I'm going to let you share in some of the profits that are being created, then you swing the store open to something that, that needs a lot more exploration than the whole um, beat them down and type of thing. I think that's brilliant, actually, because I, I can imagine that if you do that, those rentals instead of renting for a year or six months or three months are more apt to stay longer. Absolutely. Why would they leave? <laughs> they're they're, yeah. they're more, better able to stay and, and they can en enjoy a, a little bit higher quality of lifestyle by, by participating. Yeah. It seems like Airbnb now is like the hot thing. What are the advantages of Airbnb and where should we be worried about Airbnb? Well, that's, that's a great, great question. And, and first, I'm going to tell you that Airbnb is just one planet in the solar system of short-term rentals, okay? So, but it has the biggest gravity pull, all right? So we'll best, we're going to shrink, the, shrink this vast world down to just Airbnb and, and say that, that Airbnb um, has a, um, the premise of traditional of short stays where people stay on weekends and um, – at a time, four days at a time, business travelers. That's kind of the way I personally use it, and, and many people do. Well, you're gonna, you're gonna, as as a rental owner, about 10, 10 stays or ten days of Airbnb is gonna be equivalent to about one month's worth of income. So you could make up to three times uh, with Airbnb if you were doing, a, if you're able to fill your um, rental for a full month. Now, I focus on extended stay version of Airbnb, just like there's, there's hotels that, um, like Holiday Inn, and then there's hotels like Extended Stay America. They have different emphasis. They grab a different crowd. So 
I think um, doing extended stay version of Airbnb, you're going to using Airbnb as a the artificial intelligence that it is, because it's a virtual thing. Using as artificial intelligence has a masterful marketing. You're able to find out who's coming to your area that's looking for an extended stay. And once you flush that out using Airbnb, you can create some relationships directly with those companies and just bypass them. So that it's a great um, booster rocket into the, the world of corporate housing and, and an extended stay housing. Um, I should say into the universe because there's many different planets in, out there in the universe and there's a world of opportunities. Um, within Airbnb, you can make a fortune and it's, and it's easier to make a fortune um, including it and without out there in the universe as well. Scott Todd. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a great concept. I, I mean, like, I think that um, really, really that's the thing is like, not just saying, okay, I'm going to have this unit and this is what I'm going to do with it. It's more of you, you have many different options and a lot of people don't realize all of the options that people that you have with, when you have this asset, right? It doesn't always have to be in that traditional sense that we always think about. Right. So, I, I mean, I think that's really, really cool and kind of creative thinking, you know, and, and I think that I think that what you're hitting on is right. You know, like there's there's many different opportunities for uh, ancillary revenue with any type of real estate, you know, like uh, what, whether it's, you know, car sharing or, you know, how, how like I mean, like literally billboards. You mentioned billboards, for example, you know, like that's a great revenue for, for you, the property owner. But then if you're taking some of that money to help offset some of the rents, for example, then that will become kind of um, a differentiator for you to keep your tenants, which I know in multifamily is a big, you know, that, that turnover is a big, a big component of it. Oh, yeah, that can completely drain you. That's, that's yeah. one of the worst things. My, like I, out of my eight unit, my, my laboratory, I call it, uh, three of them, I have people that have been with me for six years and longer. So. Um, they're my long-term tenants, and they think, um, and again, I focus on three to six-month stays, and so my long-term tenants think that they are Airbnb hosts. <laughs> they welcome the guests. They they enjoy slightly, they enjoy below market rents themselves because I incentivize them, and they, they take care of everything for, they help people out, they answer questions, they, they make people feel at home, and it really works by incentivizing them to um, with lower rents and a, and, a, and a well a better kept place a well groomed place because I can afford to keep it keep it groomed it really really works out it, it's really brilliant um, I got one last question before we get to tip oh don't stop the fun I know I know <laughs> what is rental arbitrage okay well rental arbitrage is when you you pick a a location and a place where you think is going to be a great short-term, um, a place for short-term rentals. And you talk to the owner of that place. It could be a condo. It could be a house. It could be whatever. So you talk to the owner of it and you tell them that you want to do your, expand your corporate housing company there. And you work out all the subleasing clauses right off the bat. You got to address that. And then the goal is to, to bring in, two to three times the income uh, of what the expense will be. Like you have to pay, say, say Scott's the mean landlord and I have to pay him a thousand dollars. Well, my goal is to bring in $2,000 and the difference I get to keep. But um, Scott has to take care of the maintenance of the place because I'm just a regular tenant. So, so that's the sweet spot. I can, I can pick the location where I think is, I'll be really successful and um, acquire it or control it is that that idea of controlling but not owning to to get the the cash flow the whole rockefeller uh, principle so that's rental arbitrage you just control it through a lease instead of a mortgage and enjoy the cash flow without the maintenance what are the risks the the risk is that you can't keep it booked <laughs> of course you fall through so it's all a marketing game you got to know how to market and, and and that's really important and um also, if, if you can't, if you can't um, get, it, get it rented, then you can drop back to being a traditional landlord and break even, right, and rent out your lease. So you have a safety net. That's what's, that's what's great about a furnished rental. 
And, you know, as soon as you furnish, that's your safety net. You got many options. And if you, if you, um, if you can't do that, then, then you're going to have to uh, use the exit clause in your lease agreement. And sometimes it's one month's rent or two months rent, whatever the clause is, according to fair housing in your, in your, in your town. But it, it's not like going bankrupt. <laughs> it's not like losing a foreclosure. Not, not at all. So and then, the risk comparing to um, is, is, is minuscule. Okay, and, and then like how much money are you spending on furnishings to like furnish furnish a unit? Is it, you know, $25,000? Like, like so, so one guy that does Airbnb rentals told me he spends twenty five to $30,000 per unit to get it up, which seems mm. kind of logical, but <laughs> that's also a lot of money too, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's really important when, you, when, we, when you're talking about short-term rentals or especially rental arbitrage that you're talking about time to break even. So it's not how much you're spending. You're saying, well, when will I break even? Would you agree? Well, I think it's always the case, you know. Yeah, that's, that's the main thing. So I, I aim to break even in uh, seven to eight months with it, and then, then it's, it's cash flow from there on out. S some people who don't think that way, they, um, they break even maybe two years, and then they quit by the time they break even. They're, they're burnt out. So that's why that break even is the only mature way of talking about uh, how you're improving your rental. If, if his cash flow supports that $30,000, he can break, in, break even within a year, then that sounds like a good business. If he can squeeze that time down to uh, six months, um, I have some, some people that I coach have got it down to four months of a break even, and, and, but they were being resourceful. You know, When they furnished the place, they were... Um, Using, using their friends' furniture and, and they were using used things. They were getting things free off of um, Facebook. They're being very resourceful. So that's the way to uh, create the money that you can actually, because only the net income after you break even is something that you can use for your lifestyle, right? Right. If, if you're still underwater, you really can't uh, spend that money. You're just filling back your coffers. Well, Al, this is fascinating and instead of being the leading landlord.com you should be like the most creative landlord <laughs> i'm blushing <laughs> so so al we're at the point now in the podcast where we want to ask you for your tip of the week a okay. website a resource a book something actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses improve their lives what have you got i got you know i'm really excited to offer um, an expense reduction for people who own property which is um, everyone has uh, drains and drains get clogged with hair and different things and you, sometimes you end up uh, calling a plumber or doing the work yourself but all that can be eliminated if you do practice preventative maintenance and I, I recommend a green gobbler it's the product you can get at Home Depot this is the product Home Depot themselves use at all their stores is a biologically friendly uh, Drano uh, um, product and um, what you do is instead of waiting for a clog, you just throw it in every time <laughs> you go visit the property, you make it available for your tenants. Um, you oversupply your tenants on it because they're not going to burn their hands. They don't need gloves or worry about chemical spills. So Green Gobbler is it. It is um, it's based on products that we used in, in wastewater treatment at the wastewater treatment plants to break up clogs. So we so it's not magical foo foo dust. It's it's a proven um, uh, product that's that's used at wastewater treatment plants. Instead of waiting for the product, the water to get all the way down to the wastewater treatment plant, you can actually before you inject, you can inject it right up at the point of use, and um, prevent those clogs from happening, and prevent um, any plumbing bills. So how's that? I love it. I'm I'm ordering it right now. Not ah, good for my house. Get so your house. it's pretty cheap. It's twelve bucks it's on Amazon. Cheap. Just th just add it um, the first of the month. Just throw it in where where you have where you think you're gonna have a product. Or if you're doing short term rentals, you throw it in between guests, and you'll never have an issue. So just, you're basically you're gonna have an umbrella and think it's not raining. So that but don't lower your umbrella. <laughs> just stay up wow. on it. <laughs> so just in the in the bathrooms, the showers, the sinks. Yeah, especially places that collect hair. 
This okay. this causes the hair to get slippery and it slips through the the pipe so it doesn't uh, clog up. Wow. All right, done and done. I just bought it. All right. That's going to save you a lot of money. I love it. I love it. Um, and I'm like the worst homeowner ever. So my wife's going to be really impressed. <laughs> anyone should not own a home, it's me. Saving marriage is one step at a time, one day at a time. There it is. There it is. Um, Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? I mean, how, how do you compare to the Green Gobbler, man? I'm, I'm like on their website and notice that like they have like vinegar mixtures too, which, you know, vinegar, that's good for anything, man. Like, Mark, you need, you need to like visit some, spend some time on their website. I know. <laughs> and to help you remember to do that, to help you to remember to go back to their website, my tip will help you remember things. Check out elephant.rocks. That's it. Like not, not .com, but like elephant.rocks, which okay. I didn't even know was a real thing, but it is. And what's cool about elephant.rocks is that basically – R O C K S. Okay. Right. What's cool about it is that like you can text, you can text elephant and use like real normal language. Like, Hey, remind me to call mom tomorrow at 10 AM. And then it will, rem it will uh, schedule it and it will remind you at 10 AM to call your mom. So like instead of having going to your calendar or whatever, you can speak normal language and it will know things. So like you can share like, hey, mom's phone number is this, or this is mom. And then boom, it, it begins to know and to support your life all with like natural language. It's pretty cool. That's cool. A That's second. a smart elephant. How is this any different than reminders on the iPhone? Oh uh, man, because the thing is, is that um, one, uh, like for me, I don't like reminders on the, on the phone. Cause I do, I, I prefer text. And so like, I'm always sending myself text. Okay. And so, it, you know, essentially cause it sits there in the, um, in the pieces of puzzle. Let me go to the other app. How many times are you in text in a day? So that's the, the big thing. Um, I don't know, man. It's pretty cool. You should try it out and you can try it out. Right, I'm, I'm doing it right now. So I'm I go going right there. Yeah. Smart elephant. Set up. Yeah. Wait, I'm going to go to nine one nine. Three, seven, three. Three seven three. Six four six three. And six, then you, four six three. Yeah, and then you have to use the word setup. Set up. Plus uh your name, like Mark. Do I do a space or just Scottsdale? Okay. Scottsdale. Let's see if this works. All right, um, I've got nothing back. Give it a minute. Oh, elephant is ready to roll with time zone set to Australia, Hobart. What? Yeah. Did <laughs> you, you put can in Scottsdale? Up? Did you type Scottsdale? Yeah, I think it thinks I'm in Scottsdale, Australia. <laughs> well, that's interesting. All right, Scott Todd. I'm going to try it again. <laughs> I think he took off. Do you, do you leave? No, I, I, I bold. I, I, I am bold. I'm still here. All right. I tried it again with Phoenix. All right. I think it's cool. It, I'll try it. it. But you know what? No one's going to beat my tip of the week because my tip of the week is going to bring you wealth. And that's learn more about Al Williamson and his incredibly creative ways to increase the net income of any rental property. Just go to leadinglandlord.com. Leadinglandlord.com. I'm just looking at his blog right now. The story behind the, the most profitable rental arbitrage on record. Cool keyless lock for wood gates. The seven laws of abundance. Using leak detectors to cut insurance premiums. That's like my next buy. Wi-Fi, a landlord's untapped profit center. Eliminate plenty of bills forever. We just learned about that. Man, those are good ideas. I know. Business plan for arbitrage. Six steps to get started with rental arbitrage. This is incredible. Scott Todd. I, I think I have shiny object syndrome. Help me. Stay focused, Mark. Stay focused. <laughs> okay. Okay, Al, you know, you know what beats your model? What's that? No tenants and passive income, which leads me to Al Williamson. Check out how we do that at thelandgeek.com. If you're getting value from this podcast, please do us a favor. Just do little three little things. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at We're going to send you for free our $97 
passive income launch kit. And you know what? Share the, share the, uh, the podcast on the interwebs. Put it on the social medias, the Instagrams, the Twitters, the Facebooks. I don't know. The Snapchats. <laughs> Whatever it is. No, Mark, is one, Scott? Yeah. No, I was just going to think like, you know, I, I heard a, uh, I heard like a brilliant marketing campaign today. I'm just trying to figure out how we can incorporate it into what we do here, which was, you know, the brand Popsicle, they make the Popsicles, like the Popsicle mm-hmm. company. And if you remember when we were kids, the Popsicles were like two Popsicles in a pack, right? Like you had two and you had to go and you had to break it. Yeah. You had to share it with somebody or you had to eat them real fast before they melted. That's well, right. then the popsicle company got smart and they decided to make them singles. So they said on their, their Twitter the other day, they're like, hey, if, you, if this tweet gets retweeted 100,000 times, we'll bring back the, the doubles. Well, it went like well more than 100,000 times, okay? So I think that the, that the doubles are coming back. So maybe we should do something like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, share this 100,000 times, give Al some love, give, you know, give us some love, and uh, I don't know, like, what, what, what can we give them? Like, I don't know. Hat? I want your super pack of your launch, launch kit. Oh. Done. <laughs> 100,000 times. Everybody okay. gets one. Everybody okay. gets one. I like Sorry. it. <laughs> exactly. You get a launch kit. You get a launch kit. <laughs> Just email us. You don't even have to leave a review. Just retweet it 100,000 times. Everyone gets a launch kit. <laughs> I love it. All right. I want to thank everybody again. Thank you, Al Williamson from leadinglandlord.com. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. Al Williamson, are we good? We're good. Hey, thank you so much for having me and share me with your audience. I appreciate it. Thank you. And listeners, you know what we're going to say. Let freedom ring. ring. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>